Welcome to Unpolished. As far as we know, the uh, first conference of its kind that tries to help entrepreneurs, people in startups, and have a, an, an idea and a passion or an interest in faith. So welcome. You are entrepreneurs at an entrepreneur conference that mixes faith. Give yourself a hand right now. Well, uh, we don't really care exactly what your spiritual orientation is, what you believe about God, what your concept of God is, who he, she, it may be. Uh, I have some pretty uh, definitive convictions on that, but you're here because you, I believe, you're looking for some inspiration, some encouragement. Who gets beat down in your normal life? Raise your hand if you normally get beat down and discouraged. Yeah, that's about all of us. Okay, who just doesn't like raising their hands in conferences? Who would that be? Yeah, okay. I want to pray right now and exhibit a little bit of faithfulness right now and give us our first session. By the way, if you don't know me, my name is Brian Tome. I'm what's called a senior pastor here in this building. And we have five locations around the region. We've built the largest AIDS, privately funded AIDS hospice in South Africa. We've helped initiate the first faith-based uh, accelerator called Ocean. We have multiple homes over in India where we have rescued and are rehabilitating girls who have been in the sex for profit industry who have been kidnapped. Uh, we also uh, work with 6,000 kids all the way through their childhood to feed them and educate them all the way day when they're 18 and a bunch of stuff like that. And yes, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired and I understand a little bit about what it means to have some faith and need of encouragement and inspiration that takes you to a new place. So we're going to try to do that for you the next two days. And uh, let's just start our time in prayer, okay? So if you wouldn't mind, opening your eyes, looking up, bowing your head and looking down, whatever works for you. God, thank you for giving us the opportunity to slow down and be in a place like this. I pray that the words that I have and the words that our world-class speakers have from all over the globe, from all over the region, would be used by you to build the faith that you've implanted in every person here. I believe there is a level of faith in every person here, or else you wouldn't have self-selected into this and actually paid money for it. And so it's, a, it's an arduous task, God. To, uh, to make something and give an experience that's worth the effort and the time and the dollars people have put out. But we know you're a big God. I know you're a big God, and I know you can do that for us today. Please do it. And I pray these things according to your name, according to your character, the person of Jesus. Amen. Well, in our church, Crossroads, a lot of people don't understand us. A lot of people who are in churches misunderstand us and have actually given us a level of critique because they don't understand that we're actually much more like a startup than we are a church. A church is the oldest institution, the oldest marketplace in the history of the world that I'm aware of. None of the, none of the marketplaces that most of us reside in are older than 2,000 some years. And so when you bring innovation and when you bring new ideas to something that's stagnant, People misunderstand you and you get a bit discouraged and you have to keep going back and reminding yourself who you are and why you're doing what you're doing to stay encouraged and, and stay inspired. And so I want to give us some things that regularly run through my mind to keep me on the edge and keep me being the person that I think God wants me to be and I also believe that God wants you to believe. I'm a big reader of biographies. I'm a, a big learner of people who are doing amazing things. I, I read with amazing excitement the Steve Jobs biography that, that he actually commissioned with Walter Isaacson. It's a fascinating read of a very disturbed individual. It's really wild if you ever read that. You can't find anybody in the entire book, anybody who knows Steve Jobs that thinks highly of him because he acted like a god. Today, first session, I'm going to help you see that you are not God, but believe it or not, you're like God. You're not God, but you're like God. Even that statement reminds me of an ancient movie that probably only those of us who are over 40 remember. The question is, do I have a God complex? Dr. Kessler says yes. Which makes me wonder if this lawyer has any idea as to the kind of grades one has to receive in college to be accepted at a top medical school. 
If you have the vaguest clue as to how talented someone has to be to lead a surgical team. I have an MD from Harvard. I am board certified in cardiothoracic medicine and trauma surgery. I have been awarded citations from seven different medical boards in New England, and I am never, ever sick at sea. So I ask you, when someone goes into that chapel and they fall on their knees and they pray to God that their wife doesn't miscarry, or that their daughter doesn't bleed to death, or that their mother doesn't suffer acute neural trauma from post-operative shock, who do you think they're praying to? Now, you go ahead and read your Bible, Dennis, and you go to your church, and with any luck, you might win the annual raffle, but if you're looking for God, he was in operating room number two on November 17th, and he doesn't like to be second-guessed. You ask me if I have a God complex? Let me tell you something. I am God. Lightning comes down and consumes Alec Baldwin. That's, that's why he gained all the weight that he has. He's look, he looks awful since that video clip. All because he said what he said. Let me be really clear. We are not saying, I'm not saying that you are God, but... You are like God. What do I mean by that? Point number one. You are like God in that entrepreneurs create things. Entrepreneurs create things. One of the first tenets in the Bible is that God made men and women in his image. He made you in his image. You are like him in a way that my dog Winston is not like him. In a way that absolutely my cat Frank is not like him. That's for darn sure. You have creative capacities that no one else has except for God. Think about this for a moment. Beavers, you might say, well, beavers create. Well, they create dams, but they never innovate and go beyond the dam. Birds create nests, but they've never invented how to do a brick. Fish kind of create schools that they go through, but a fish has never innovated how to get onto dry land. The only created being that can innovate and say, hey, let's fly when we're not created to fly are human beings. Hey, let's create a microchip that operates faster than my mind. It can draw data together because I've never seen it or thought of it. The only ones who can think of something outside of your known are human beings. Dogs can't create, cats can't create, gerbils can't create. They just do what they do. But you and I are able to jump over into a whole new thing. We can see things in our mind that no one else has seen because God's given us creative capacities. I first got this insight from my friend Todd Henry. He'll be speaking uh, to us tomorrow. And I was reminded of this when I was reading David McCullough's book just recently on the Wright Brothers, a fantastic, fantastic documentary. I didn't understand anything about the Wright Brothers. All I knew was they were the first people in flight. They lived in Dayton. And then there was this Kitty Hawk thing. What's Kitty Hawk? And I thought Kitty Hawk was the name of his cat or something like that. I didn't understand it. And I realized that these people didn't innovate off of previous people flapping wings who were trying to fly, they did something totally different. They saw something that no one had ever seen. They saw that it was wind going over a shape of a wing that lifted the aircraft. And so they tried to find a place in the country that had the most steady, consistent wind, and it was Kitty Hawk down by the Outer Banks. So they had to haul all their gear down there. They had to build structures there. They had to innovate how to get there just so they had a constant wind that they could experiment with a wing to go forward on. And they said, okay, how do we possibly get something up in the air without wind? We need to invent the propeller. And they thought, well, let's just go to the Navy and take their corkscrews off their battleships and we'll use that. And they found out it was completely random measurements. There wasn't any science to it all. And so they had to figure out how thick the props should be, how long the blades should be, what the angle was. And they were going beyond what anybody else had ever done. And they were thinking and dreaming of flying. Because only somebody who's created in the image of God can think and dream of flying. Your role here today is so important. 
the future of your friendships, the future of your family, if you have one, the future of your business, I might say the future of the world, of the world, depends on people who are created in the image of God to use your creative capacities to start something. Because improving current processes never changes the world. Doing something more methodically never changes the world. Growing something incrementally that people understand never brings life. It only slows down death. It's always the new things, the new places that we jump that are where God is. You might say, well, where does this come from? It comes from the very Bible itself. If you look all throughout the Bible, I don't know why we ever got this idea that God is some fuddy-duddy entity that isn't into the new. Let's talk about the new things. Number one, he creates a new earth. The Bible starts off with God creating something new. Some people try to stump the preacher man every once in a while and say, oh yeah, well what about other life forms? Or what, Are you saying that earth is the only place where there's inhabitants? Absolutely not. I'm not saying that at all. People say, well, what about this idea of expanding universe? Doesn't that sort of diminish the idea of the Bible? The Bible never speaks against an expanding universe, or as some theorists say right now, multiple universes. The Bible never says that at all. It just gives a story of this creation. Of course God's creating other planets right now. Of course I believe there's life forms elsewhere. Because We really think that a creative God would start with Earth and say, okay, I'm done creating. Let's just innovate and improve Earth gradually. Absolutely not. God creates a brand new nation called the nation of Israel. We're going to hear from a Jew tomorrow who's going to talk about why is it the Jews are so effective and successful. And it's because they've tapped into this newness and sound business principles. God goes off and he, he gives new messages to these people who are called the prophets. Jesus comes and starts this new thing called the church. When Jesus comes, it's a new innovation because God himself comes down and lives amongst us and takes on flesh. This is new. This is not seen in any other form of spirituality and religion. That God would actually become a person and take on flesh. And Jesus talks about things like new wineskins. He says, I'm coming to bring a new wineskin. Not an old wineskin. Old wineskins might give more mellow and better tasting wine. But what I bring it's the stuff that's vibrant. It's the stuff that's effervescent. And you have to have a flexible new wineskin to flex with the fermenting process. Jesus says, if you want me to get involved in your life, you better be a new wineskin kind of person. If you're into the old, I will burst your life open. You need to exhibit a level of flexibility because where I come and where the Spirit of God comes, there is movement. There is catalytic procedures. There is new stuff that takes place. The Bible talks when we come into a relationship with him, we become a quote-unquote new self or a new man. The new, I mean, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of things. So if you're here, you like the new, and you're pretty close. You're closer to God than you think that you are because you're operating in his core wheelhouse. The second way that we're like God, we're like God in that entrepreneurs grow things. We grow things. And we want to grow things incredibly significantly. We've got uh, some VCs who are in the room, and I would have you raise your hand, but people would swarm all over you, so I'm not going to have you raise your hand. But where does the idea for venture capitalism come from? Where does the idea of investment banking come from? Do you know the most ancient reference we have to investment banking and making an investment for return is from Jesus himself? Jesus tells a story about God. He says what God does is he gives different talents and abilities and amounts to different people. And then he comes back and he checks up on them. And the people who don't grow what God has given them, God gets upset and he snatches away from them and he gives it to somebody else who's going to grow it. In the book of Luke chapter 8 verse 18, Jesus says this. He gives disproportionately to people who are going to return an amount. And you're here today because you want to return something back to back in profit, in adoration of God, in, in, in value that we add. You're here to grow things. 
Part of the problem I had with understanding God was my church background was all about God was about safe, all about doing things regular. And it's really weird in church circles. Whenever something starts to grow, everyone thinks something weird is happening. Oh, man, you know, big, uh, that church, uh, uh, that guy's making millions. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah he, he has a private plan. Uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, you know he's got some chicks on the side. Uh, uh, well, you know, he, uh, you know, well, you know uh, well, I hear that they... Uh, 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 it's really weird. Uh, well, what is wrong with us that if we see something of a spiritual nature that's growing, we think something's wrong with it? Jesus says, no, if there's something of a spiritual nature and it's not growing, there's something wrong with it. Stagnancy... And being mediocre is not a value of God. And yet many people in my quote unquote industry believe it is. It is not according to Jesus. You're here today because God wants to grow your business. He expects to grow your life. He wants to grow your life. He wants to give you more depending on your capacity and your willingness to grow it. Three, we're like God because entrepreneurs bless people. We bless people. In the beginning of every business plan, what do you look at? What is the market? What's another way to say what is the market? Another way to say that is what is it that people want or that people need? One of the fascinating things about Steve Jobs, given I just kind of cracked on him, one of the things that was fascinating about him was he was able to see what people wanted and needed before they would articulate what they wanted and needed. I mean, no one, was, no one was going around thinking, you know what I need is a, I need a little device in my pocket that has music on it. That's what I need. No one, no one was thinking that. No one was saying that. No one was saying, you know what I need is a device that collects to this thing called the internet where I can get an instantaneous song for 99 seconds and not go into Records or Us or Virgin Records. That's what I really need. No one was saying that. No one was saying, what I really need is a device, it's a phone, and it's a over and over. And then once we saw it, I was like, oh my gosh, I need that. <laughs> I need, in fact, I need every new possible upgrade. What did Steve Jobs do? Why is he such a magnetic figure for so many people? I believe it's because he's the only father figure that a lot of people have ever had that's actually given them something. <laughs> I paid for something, but you gave me a new technological buzz. You're sort of like a daddy figure. And I believe we have a heavenly father that's existed to bless us We're not the center of his plan, but a core quality of what he does is set up systems of blessing the things that are created in his image. That's why in the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verse 2, he gives a new vision to a guy named Abraham, and he says, through you, all people... and bless people who are on your downline. Encourage and bless people in your organizations. Encourage and bless people who might be buying product from you. Encourage and bless people who who are in your sphere. God pours into you so that you in turn will turn around and pour into the other. It's what we do as image bearers. It's what we do as people who are like God. And for that to happen, you have to be willing to be blessed today. You've got to be willing for God to build into you. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he didn't send a committee. (laughs) No, it doesn't say that, but uh, it's true. You never see in the Bible any committees that are doing new things. You never see groupthink in the Bible. You never see it being positive. You never see in the Bible how it goes before a board and all of a sudden the idea gets refined and then it's a good idea. You never see that anywhere in the Bible. Now, I'm a big team guy. We'll talk about that later. But for the purpose of what I'm saying right now is this. When God wants to get something done, he starts with a person. And guess who that person is? You. You. He blesses people because the instigation of everything that is new and great starts through a solo individual. You're important to God. You're like God. And he wants to use you to bless people and and, and fire them up. And so one of the best things that you can do for yourself is give your people, give your business a fired up you. Every day, the first thing I have to ask myself is, how do I honor my God today? And how do I energize myself? Because the best way I can bless people is to give them a fired up and energize me.
It's the best way. It's one of the reasons why my time with God every morning, most mornings, is <laughs> very important because if I'm not connecting with the source and if I'm not getting energized and fired up, I got nothing to give. So you being here today and tomorrow isn't taking time away from the thing that's really your calling. This is your calling. You need to take care of the thing that God created and he created you. And the best thing you can do for your future, for your organization's future, is to give it a fired up, centered, grounded, creative, and innovative view. By the way, if any time I say something you agree with, you can, you can like clap, you can do that. You guys are dead this morning. I'm up here working my noogies off. If you're working my noogies off, you're just looking at me like, Ugh. you're all you're thinking, no, I know you have a plane. I know you don't. I don't. <laughs> we can be excited today. We can. So, uh, or maybe I'm just not that good right now and I'm boring you. So sorry for that. Hey, this is called, this is called unpolished, by the way. No, seriously, don't, don't, don't be, um, don't be fooled. This conference is called unpolished because there is a lot of things that we have not figured out. Don't be deluded by the nice sets. Well, in fact, I saw a couple people earlier on and I bumped in and said, oh my gosh, why don't I ask you to speak? We're, you're getting on stage, so just get ready. Give me your cell phone, bring you on. This is very unpolished, so give us grace today as we figure out lines, as we figure out speakers, as we figure out, just give us grace because this is a new thing. We haven't been able to go to school on anybody and so I hope that you, uh, you'll give us a level of grace. Is that okay? All right, good. Thank you. And then uh, fourth and final thing. We're like God in that entrepreneurs have a vision that endures difficulty. Entrepreneurs have a vision that endures difficulty. If you look in the Bible where there's a leader and where there's people, the people don't have the vision. The leader has the vision. And the people bring the difficulty. <laughs> It's true. It's true. And so I know, though, some of us feel that really personally right now. <laughs> In my industry, they, we say ministry would be great if it wasn't for the people. Um, and it's the same in your industry. Entrepreneurs have vision, and when you have vision, you will have to endure difficulty in two areas, resources and relationships. I know everybody in here right now who's a true, in true startup mode who is going to get in startup mode, I know these are the constant and never-ending pinch points for you. Resources and relationships. And, and, and you keep thinking, yeah, but if I just get to this level, it'll go away. No, it won't. You keep thinking, yeah, but if I can just replace this person, then that won't happen. No, the next person will give you grief as well. Yeah, but yeah, but if I can get this next round of funding, then I'll be, oh, no, you won't. Yeah, but if I get, no, no, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you would, if you had given me a picture of what Crossroads looks like now, 20 years after we started, I can remember so clearly, 20, I moved here in November of 1995 and there was 11 people who had a dream to start a church for people who had given up on church but hadn't necessarily given up on God. And so I did an insurance salesman thing. I said, okay, give me all the names and numbers you know of people who might be interested and so I, I would have two breakfasts a day, two lunches a day, an afternoon coffee. I gained 20 pounds in the three or four months or so from when we had the idea to when we were actually going to start the thing. And it was rough. It was brutal. And I thought, if you could give me a picture of today, uh, it was just me on staff, you could give me a picture today of the size of Crossroads, the amount our budget is, I would go, phew, that is awesome. Man, I hope the, whole, the work would have been worth it because at that point, you're just like on easy street. You're just having a good old time. I'll tell you what, my stress level in relationships and resources is no different now than it was before. In fact, my stress level in many ways is higher because the numbers are higher. And the only reason I'm not in a funny house is God has grown me spiritually. <laughs> God's grown me spiritually. He's grown my faith to where financial challenges don't freak me out as much as it did 20 years ago, even though there's seven zeros behind it. The challenge is every bit of the relationships are every bit is great. 
Right now, we thought, man, this will be great. We're going to start this conference, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, maybe pocket some money to do X, Y, Z. No, we're losing, we're losing over $100,000 at this conference. You go, whoa, why? What? Uh, and you go, oh, that's, all, that's always the way it is. <laughs> we always think that this idea is going to make things easier financially, and it never does. Because the idea, if someone has this idea in our, our team, let's, let's bless people and do this ocean thing. And you're going to hear, be hearing about that from the leader of that. And all, we're like, oh, that's awesome. It's, oh, gosh, it's been backbreaking work. It's taken money. It hasn't brought money. It's, it's taken money. It always works that way. We had a campaign to raise money way, way years. I thought, well, this would be the last one we do. No, I'm about ready to go in my fourth campaign I've led. Part of the reason why I don't have a jet is I've cashed out everything four times in a row. I'd love to have a second house. Can't have a second house when, when you're leading people and trying to model sacrifice campaign after campaign. It never, ever, and I finally just come to realize with God, God, that's just part of the calling you've given me. Resource will always be a challenge, and relationships. Relationships will always be a challenge. Relationships with people who don't understand what we're doing. Relationships with people who I thought were core to my life and on our staff who leave and they spread lies about me, accuse me of sexual harassment, tell, me there's, tell people there's weird things happening financially at Crossroads. Lies, lies, lies that aren't verified. We have external accountants and external stuff that come in every hour. I go, I'm not trying to defend myself. I'm just saying the stuff that, well, I am a little bit. The stuff that's out there <laughs> that's come from people who I've done their wedding I've, I've walked them through major pain, and then it comes back and you go, what, what is going on? Relationships and resources, it never stops. It's always a tension point. And do we think Jesus had an easier life? Do we see anybody of faith in the history of the world that goes after something new and has it easy? Where does this fantasy come from? It definitely doesn't come from people of faith. It definitely come, doesn't come from the Bible. You're going to have to get really good at enduring difficulty. You're going to have to get really good because it will not stop. And that's why we want to be a respite for you for two days. And when you do have success and effectiveness and when God does bless you, you're going to have to remind yourself of how he brought you through the difficulty because it was him working in and through you. Right now, our city is having a level of success and a newer thing that's working to bless the poor. Our city, Cincinnati, bring people out of, out of generational poverty who are in the working poor. It's called CityLink. It was written up recently with a, um, Major League Baseball has gotten behind it. Bob McDonald, former CEO of P&G, and now with the Veteran Affairs with the uh, country, came over and is doing a new thing with CityLink. And everyone's in love with CityLink right now. It's doing phenomenal, phenomenal stuff. But, man, we forget that for 10 years we've been around Cincinnati, it was just a whipping boy. Went back and just sort of reviewed some of the headlines because people don't understand new things. That's part of why there's the difficulty. Here's some, some of the headlines over the last 10 years. They look kind of like this. I think they do. Do we have them? Center and West End opposed. Another one. Community votes against center. Most in West End opposed CityLink. Council vote opposes CityLink. Zoning board gets CityLink. It's time to fight off CityLink again. CityLink patronizing approach is insulting. CityLink project on hold, proposed West End Mall, waiting for possible appeals. Appeals in court rules in favor of CityLink. This court allows CityLink to be built. CityLink revives West End vision. <laughs> Tell you what, that was, that was 10 years, that was 10 years and $10 million to come to that place. And God is going to want you to endure difficulty. My last verse for you for this, this first session, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 16. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you perceive it? Do you perceive it? Hey, I'll tell you right now. God says, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Do you perceive it? Do you perceive that God's doing a new thing in you right now? Do you feel it? Do you perceive it? Do you perceive that God is putting an idea in you because you're like him? Do you perceive it? Do you perceive it that God's trying to coddle you a little bit right now? He's trying to encourage you and say, you're not crazy. You're not alone because I'm there. And you know why it's difficult? It's because no one's been there before. And you know why no one's been there before? Because everyone's been acting like a dog and not wanting to innovate. 
I tell you what, if it was easy, they would have sent a dog with a note. <laughs> and that's why we need faith. Faith is that, that in-between spot of, 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 of vision, of vision of where it is, and fearfulness. Guess what? Whatever you're doing right now, somebody else had the idea for it, but they didn't move on it because they had fear instead of faith. Faith is the thing that says, I see where I need to go, but I, I, I don't want to, I'm a little freaked out about it. In fact, when you're freaked out by it, that's a great sign because if you're afraid, then guess what? Someone who is smarter than you saw it sooner than you, but their fear kept them from making it a reality. When you have the smell of fear, it's the smell of opportunity because there's something that can be taken hold of and built and maybe you and the faith and the new thing God is doing in you can be the one to bring it to reality. Do you smell it? Do you feel like, God, I, I pray for every entrepreneur, every wannabe entrepreneur in here, every person who's in old organizations is going to bring an entrepreneurial flair to that organization. I pray for everybody in here who's got an idea that people think is crazy. They need to endure and they need to realize they're created in your image and they're loved by you and equipped by you. Help them, God. Help them bless every person in this room. Amen. Amen. 